Eye of the Storm, Facing Climate and Social Chaos with Calm and Courage, by Terry LePage, published in 2023 by Open Door Communication. Michael Dowd is the audio narrator. Audio narrator's note, Michael Dowd speaking. Uh, I am recording this just in my home. This is not a professional studio recording. I will occasionally undoubtedly mispronounce words and stumble. I'm recording this because I think this is one of the most important books of our time, and I would love everybody to read it or to listen to it. So you'll sometimes hear my enthusiasm, and I may even, on particularly excellent paragraphs, I may say, now that paragraph is so good, I'm going to read it again. So just giving you a heads up. The other thing I'll say here at the start is that this book is designed to be read in in bite-sized chunks. It's excellent for study groups, uh, and I encourage you, if you like this audio book, please support the publisher, support the author, buy a paperback copy. You'll want to mark it up. Table of Contents. Read this first. Is this book for you? Chapter 1, Facing the Storm. 2. Stories shape us. Three, stories for courage in dark times. Four, practical emotional support. Five, befriending grief. Six, belonging and reverence. Seven, resigning from the rat race. Eight, connection and compassion. Nine, letting go. Ten, No More Flying Solo. 11. Young People and Those Who Care About Them. 12. Planting Seeds. 13. In the Meantime. And 14. Endings and Beginnings. Preface. In the past three years, I have supported hundreds of people who are facing or anticipating great loss from climate chaos, ecological devastation, and social upheaval. I have met them in my local community and in the international online group called the Deep Adaptation Forum, whose purpose is embodying and enabling loving responses to our predicament. I have witnessed their fear, their grief and despair, and their struggle to make sense of the strange new world unfolding around us. Species and habitats are disappearing before our eyes. Climate change, it turns out, means cataclysmic floods, epic fires, unprecedented heat waves and droughts, and other life-changing disruptions. Meanwhile, many governments and social systems seem to be crumbling before our eyes. I have observed what helps people cope and what empowers them to take constructive action. I'm inspired by so many people whose responses to the breakdowns we face is to serve others, human and non-human. I participate in activist networks in my area, but I don't expect to save much. Instead, I aim to help human and non-human communities live well, to proclaim the value and dignity of that which may be lost, or to act simply because it seems the right thing to do. I offer this book as a companion and guide to help you cope and to respond to our predicament with compassion, creativity, and courage then you will find your particular ways of service and action. I have worked as a research chemist, so I have some understanding of the scientific method around the climate crisis and the limitations of predictive models. I have been privileged to support people at the end of life and their families and to train people in in nonviolent communication as taught by Marshall Rosenberg. I bring my experience as a transitional minister in liberal Christian churches to this book. In times of transition, I have been the eye of the storm, the non-anxious presence who invites others into a space of calm reflection on how to put their values into practice despite an uncertain future. I know the power of framing our experiences through stories that express our values. I'll say that again. In times of transition, I have been the eye of the storm, the non-anxious presence who invites others into a space of calm reflection on how to put their values into practice, despite an uncertain future. I know the power of framing our experiences through stories that express our values. I wish for you, reader, to hold your ground amid fear and trouble, make the best choices you can with what you have, 
and make meaning and joy, whatever the state of the world. By doing this, you can be a refuge for others to shelter from chaos. You can be the eye of the storm. Read this first. Is this book for you? In 2018, I first began to take in the likelihood of severe and irreversible climate disruption in the next decade or two. At that time, almost all scientists and pundits were saying, we can reverse climate change. Even now, researchers delivering the most dire predictions are expected to finish their horrific lists with an appeal to reverse the trend. It's not too late. I find this stance dishonest. Although the time courses are uncertain, there's no more time to prevent massive losses of vast swaths of life on the planet, loss of global industrial consumer society, and loss of many human lives and cultures. I'm watching the losses begin to unfold now. If you acknowledge this reality, this book is for you. If you do not know how to face this reality, this book may be for you. If you do not want to face this reality, this book is not for you. Maybe you've already witnessed a beloved forest, farm, or river mined, or laid to waste for human gain, or seen a long-champion human or non-human rights cause fall to greed, scapegoating, or power plays. Maybe you grew up watching those in power over you, extracting freedom and sustenance away from you and your community. If so, you've experienced one of the many kinds of collapses that have always been happening around the world. You already have valuable experience in knowing how to weather some form of collapse. I'm sorry you have that hard-won experience. Know that you are not alone. The choking of ecosystems and the crushing of human rights and traditional cultures are often intertwined. Be warned. You may be only aware of a small part of what I believe is coming. Still, I hope you will join in conversations like this one in this book. Others may learn from your experience. You may be contemplating possible futures, imagining the unimaginable, and it feels like looking over the edge of a cliff. That unmoored feeling comes in part from the loss of the stories that we have told ourselves, stories about how the world works and our place in it. Now you see those stories for the lies they are, and you may be in an existential freefall. Worldviews fall hard, you need a new story. Take your time to find one worth living by. Perhaps you will find a story or two to guide you in Chapter 3, Stories for Courage in Dark Times. And please take time to study Chapter 4, Practical Emotional Support. We do stand before a kind of cliff. It marks the end of what people like me in the industrialized world know and what have relied on to live. Things like somewhat predictable weather, birds in the trees, governments that more or less function, forested mountains, living reefs, the ocean off the streets, groceries on the shelf, and water in the tap. If you suspect that you will see the end of some of these things, you have glimpsed the cliff as we hurtle toward it. Recognize, though, that people are already making a life at the base of this cliff, and some have done so for generations. Where I live, in California, some of those people are African Americans and Mexican Americans. The rest of us owe people who have lived with this struggle deep respect, and we have much to learn from them. If you see the cliff and feel overwhelmed, if you want to contribute but you do not believe that you can bear the emotional load, be kind to yourself. Do not force yourself to read more than you are ready to read. No saving the world is on offer here, so you are free of that burden. If you feel that you are to blame for what is happening, this book may support you in shifting that view. Industrial Consumer Society set up our earth home for destruction, and those of us who grew up in this system are trapped in it. Most of us do not know how to survive without it. If you have to flee your home to escape fire or flood, or were driven from home by violence or financial ruin, or have been living in fear or oppression because of your identity as a person of color, immigrant, or gender or sexual minority, you may already have stepped over the edge of that metaphorical cliff. In this book, I'll go with you in spirit. I'll share a few stories like yours, mourn with you, and speak up for you. 
I can't bring you to safety. I can witness the I can witness and affirm your worth, humanity, and creativity as you improvise to survive and live your values. I hope this book is of use to you. If you are already too familiar with the kinds of peril that await the rest of us, perhaps you can give this book, or portions of it, to the people in your life who do not yet understand your experience. Maybe you refuse to acknowledge that any collapse is unfolding. I don't blame you. Why give up hope that sufficient numbers of world governments and their citizens will start acting responsibly? That limits and tipping points of our Earth home have not been exceeded? That technology will save us? And that life as we know it can continue despite the destruction of the global household that makes it possible? I don't blame you, but I can't join you, and this book is not for you. The ideas and tools in this book are first for inner adaptation to aid you in adopting a worldview and some practices that will allow you to face disruption and hardship with calm and courage. I'll say it again. The ideas and tools in this book are first for inner adaptation, to aid you in adopting a worldview and some practices that will allow you to face disruption and hardship with calm and courage. With such a base, you can then choose the outer adaptation work to which you feel called or drawn. This book explores only a few of those choices and emphasizes one. With what you have learned from your own experience facing unfolding crises, you can be the eye of the storm, the calm center for others. We will need as much calm as we can muster to weather the, on, the coming storms with wisdom, compassion, and the least possible harm. We are all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. Throughout the book, I frequently use the term we. From the context, it should be clear whether I'm referring to all of humanity, to people who are facing our predicament, or to people who are living in or benefiting from industrial consumer society. I write from the perspective of a wealthy, university-educated white woman in the United States with liberal views and with some sense of the invisible knapsack of privileges I carry. In this book, you will find perspectives of dozens of people in my local community and the Deep Adaptation Forum international community. Most of these sections are excerpts of my interviews with them, or based on those interviews. Their voices provide a wider range of experience than I could give alone. I am deeply grateful to them for sharing their stories. Throughout the book, you will find quotes of voices other than the authors that look like this. This different style is used to aid the reader in recognizing long quotes and lists of quotes. Quotes may be from a person who was interviewed by the author or a comment on the Deep Adaptation private Facebook page or Facebook group. In that case, the words you may see are excerpted from the full quote. Brackets like this contain comments from the author. So she's describing a shift in how it looks to the visual reader, and I'll try to make adjustments in terms of my auditory so you can see that's the case, or hear that's the case. This book touches on a wide variety of subjects without exploring them fully. Refer to the bibliography at the end of the book for more depth on some of those topics. If you're looking for a detailed guide to practical political action, community organizing for mutual aid, regenerative agriculture, ecosystem re restoration, or other specific responses to our predicament, you will have to look elsewhere. You will find a variety of writing styles in this book. Essays, quotes, perspectives from many voices, poems, lists, and stories. If you are not interested in poetry or technical stuff or mental health tools, just skip those parts. You can read this book in any order. You can skim or skip sections. You can, or you can consult the table of contents and choose a chapter or even a section within a chapter that appeals to you, that appeals to you now and a different part at another time. In this book, you will find dozens of ideas and suggestions. They are resources for you to choose or let pass. I hope some of them will support your own loving responses to our predicament. So here's a slightly longer um, annotated uh, table of contents. Chapter 1, Facing the Storm. What we face and the emotional impact of realizing what we face 
in prose, poem, and story. Chapter 2. Stories Shape Us. Stories that don't work and stories that may work to frame our situation. Chapter 3. Stories for Courage in Dark Times. Three stories to describe our predicament. They do not have happy endings. They have courageous endings. Chapter 4. Practical Emotional Support. Your toolbox for dealing with difficult emotions. Chapter 5. Befriending Grief. Learning the skill of grieving to honor love and loss of all kinds. Chapter 6. Belonging and Reverence. Finding meaning and wonder in relationships and in daily living. Chapter 7. Resigning from the Rat Race. Slowing down and opting out of industrial consumer busyness and status. Chapter 8. Connection and Compassion. Tools for practicing compassion when it matters most. Chapter 9. Letting Go. Ways people are letting go of industrial consumer society and having fun doing it. Chapter 10. No More Flying Solo. Ways people are building relationships for mutual support. Chapter 11. Young people and those who care about them. How we might be of service to those who inherit this mess. Chapter 12. Planting Seeds. Gardening as Activism and Relationship. Chapter 13. In the Meantime. Ways People Are Living Their Values Now. And Chapter 14. Endings Are Beginnings. Anxiety is contagious. Calm is contagious. And courage is contagious. Using the tools in this book can help you find calm, purpose, and even joy in hard times. And you can share these things with others. You can be the eye of the storm. I'll say that again. Anxiety is contagious. Calm is contagious. And courage is contagious. Using the tools in this book can help you to find calm, purpose, and even joy in hard times. And you can share these things with others. You can be the eye of the storm. Now, let us step into the storm together. Chapter 1. Facing the Storm This chapter introduces the predicament we face. It is more than a problem. Problems invite solutions. A predicament has been defined as, quote, a difficult, perplexing, or trying situation from which there is no clear or easy way out, unquote. The chapter is made up of short sections on the following topics. Citing the Storm my dawning awareness of the depth of our predicament. Not saving the world. The solace that comes from releasing ideas of fixing the unfixable. It sounds like giving up, but it's not. Perspective. It's really that bad, and I am not alone. Kat's realization of the depth of our predicament and her discovery of a community that shares her awareness. A healthy form of avoidance. A warning against listening to pundits who predict we will all be dead or nomadic shortly. Perspective. Getting real. A list from Karen Perry of what we can still do after we envision a future of catastrophe. Don't do this alone. My experience finding like-minded people and a plea to find yours. And many voices living in two worlds. People share how they navigate living in the world of consumer, industrial consumer society's business as usual while holding an awareness of our predicament. A poem from Carol Bylock, Breathing Under Water. I built my house by the sea, not on the sands, mind you, not on the shifting sand, and I built it of rock, a strong house, by a strong sea. And we got well acquainted, the sea and I, good neighbors. Not that we spoke much. We met in silences, respectful, keeping our distance, but looking our thoughts across the fence of sand. Always the fence of sand, our barrier. Always the sand between. And then one day, and I still don't know how it happened, the sea came, without warning, 
without welcome even. Not sudden and swift, but a shifting across the sand like wine. Less like the flow of water than the flow of blood. Slow, but coming. Slow, but flowing like an open wound. And I thought of flight, and I thought of drowning, and I thought of death. And while I thought, the sea crept higher till it reached my door. And I knew, then, that there was neither flight, nor death, nor drowning. That when the sea comes calling, you stop being neighbors, well-acquainted, friendly-at-a-distance neighbors, and you give your house for a coral castle, and you learn to breathe underwater. Sighting the Storm I was in a cafe in San Luis Obispo, eating breakfast with my husband, Scott, in the summer of 2018. We had driven on spectacular Highway 1 down the central coast of California, returning to Southern California from a visit to family in the San Francisco Bay Area. This two-lane highway winds precariously along the rocky shore on fragile sandstone cliffs. Highway 1 at Big Sur had been washed out repeatedly and was unusable recently for more than a year. Rock falls and sections of one-lane road are are routine. While sipping our coffee, we were scrolling through news and social media feeds on our phones, as is our habit. I stumbled across a paper self-published weeks before by University of Cumbria professor of sustainability Jem Bendel, titled Deep Adaptation. Over a tiny crumb-filled table, my world swayed. Puzzle pieces I had been collecting and filing away tumbled into place, forming a scene out of, night- out of nightmare. Climate change was not some evil looming on a distant horizon. It was picking up speed, possibly about to upend civil society, and had already disrupted one thoughtful man's life. Strong coffee was not the cause of my shivers. When I felt present in my body again, I was astonished that I had taken so long to realize what Jim Bendel had written so bluntly. I had known about greenhouse gases since high school in 1977. I had been hoping peak oil, the decline of our world's petroleum production as reserves become harder to extract, would limit human carbon dioxide output to within livable ranges. I had foreseen the long game. At some point, I believed in the next couple hundred years, most of the ice on Greenland, and possibly on Antarctica as well, will melt or slip into the sea, some of it quickly. Industrial consumer society won't survive a roughly 215-foot sea level rise, 66 meters. I fancied fancied myself a farseer. But it's one thing to see that on some far-off day all our coastal cities and ports will be no more, and my home at 260 feet above sea level, 80 meters, will be on Block's Long Island above an inundated city. It's another thing to picture the destruction of cities in one's own lifetime. As Bendel's paper clearly spelled out, most of us have strong cognitive protections against acknowledging the likelihood of this reality. His paper removed those protections from me. Audio narrators note Michael Dowd speaking. I've recorded Jem Bendel's Deep Adaptation paper, both the original 2018 version and the updated version in, I believe, 2020. And I've also recorded maybe two dozen other of Jem Bendel's posts. If you just Google SoundCloud Jem Bendel, you'll get my playlist. I returned to work as the transitional pastor of a small church. Those people love to hear me proclaim the sacredness of earth and our duty to care for her. They were not ready to hear about the end of the world. I never said that exactly. I just kept going to the dark places in spite of my attempts to moderate my preaching. Repeatedly, I cried in the pulpit. I felt the irony. For 20 years, I had been preaching against Christian end-of-the-world thinking and the unsound theology of rapture. It's still unsound. God will not teleport anyone out of our predicament. If we were facing only the depletion of earth resources, such as oil, fertile soil, water, oceans, fisheries, and pollinators, we might experience a slow erosion of industrial consumer society. We might have enough time and 
farm-friendly weather for sections of humanity to relearn a more Earth-respecting way of living. Instead, due to the baked-in heating of the planet, we are experiencing ever-increasing regional catastrophes across the globe, from storms, fires, floods, droughts, crop failures, and heat waves. A barrage of local, regional, and specific collapses on an uncertain time frame against a background of more general decline seems to be in store, rather than one grand collapse. I'm going to read that again. Due to the baked-in heating of our planet, we are experiencing ever-increasing regional catastrophes across the globe, from storms, fires, floods, droughts, crop failures, and heat waves. A barrage of local, regional, and specific collapses on an uncertain time frame, against a background of more general decline, seems to be in store, rather than one grand collapse. As these disasters keep multiplying, we will deplete the materials, supply chains, and goodwill we need to recover from them. People now experiencing local or regional collapses are already having trouble rebuilding something like their former way of life. Social, political, and economic systems in many places will become dysfunctional. In some locations, they are already doing so. More is to come. This is the storm we face. I wrote the following poem in the summer of 2020, when the sky over my suburban California home was red with smoke from some of the four million acres of fires that burned in California that year. You told me to just be. You told me to pay attention. You told me to be humble. I am not you. I didn't strive. I witnessed. What I saw broke my heart. A world lay inside one little heart. Then I ran away. I hid. I put a tight lid on that unruly heart. But I can't live like that for long. Today I walk gingerly, shaking, crying, into the fire with you. The heart burns, but is not consumed. Fear is contagious. Calm is contagious, and courage is contagious. Those of us who have some idea of what is unfolding can prepare ourselves mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to be, as we are able, centers of calm, compassion, and courage. We can be ready to coach others to hold on to their values in hard times, because we will have pre-processed some of the loss that others will deny for a little while longer. We will be able to support them when they finally face what comes. That paragraph was excellent. I'm going to read it again. Fear is contagious. Calm is contagious. And courage is contagious. Those of us who have some idea of what is unfolding can prepare ourselves mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to be, as we are able, centers of calm, compassion, and courage. We can be ready to coach others to hold on to their values in hard times because we will have pre-processed some of the loss that others will deny for a while longer, we will be able to support them when they finally face what's come. Not saving the world begins with a quote from Debo Zarco. Once I dropped from my shoulders the self-imposed burden of having to save the world, I could breathe a sigh of relief and ask myself, what can I still do? Finally, I've found my people who understand me, unquote. This response is typical from the groups that I host. Hundreds of people have come to grief, gratitude, and courage workshops, deep adaptation welcome circles, compassionate communication practice groups, death cafes, grief circles, mutual care circles, and other groups I facilitate. Over and over, newcomers express profound relief and gratitude. They can voice their fears. They are not chided for being a doomer or being too negative. They can be heard when they speak of the devastation they are witnessing and despair, the despair and grief they are feeling, and they don't have to strive to save the world. As I write, the term collapse aware is in danger of becoming a tired meme, yet it served me well over the past few years. Collapse awareness means acknowledging that some things have gone too far to repair. The future, in one of 10 or 50 years, will look radically different from the present. 
with losses that are hard to fathom. Saving the planet and happy endings are not on the horizon. There are no solutions for the complex predicament of interconnected unfolding tragedies we face. This sad truth is hard to swallow. Still, we can take constructive action. When I first talked to my friends about my new awareness that climate chaos is irreversible and incompatible with industrial consumer society, they gently brushed me off. One touchingly honest friend said, I can't believe what you're saying, Terry. If I did believe it, my world would be turned upside down. Unquote. Indeed. Why subject yourself to this kind of thinking? Unless you want to base your actions on reality, not fantasy. When I became collapse aware in 2018, this was considered a fringe view. After the extreme fires, floods, and heat waves of the past few years, collapse awareness is no longer so fringe. But still, almost every worsening prediction by scientists, almost every dire news article, ends with the obligatory, and here's what we must now do to stop climate change. Those Save the World lists allow authors and readers to bypass the reality of our predicament. They offer false hope, even as so many people begin to feel in their bones and in their daily lives the unraveling of ecosystems and social systems. If we accept that huge losses in the human and non-human world are inevitable, then what? Are we giving up on humanity or on the planet? No. But it will look like that to those around us as if we were giving up. We may feel like we're giving up because so many things on the Save the World list no longer make sense to do. We are giving up on wishful thinking. The goal is no longer to save the world. The goal is to love the world and the humans and non-humans in it and to care for them as best we can while we can. I'll say that again. We are not giving up. We are giving up on some things, such as wishful thinking. The goal is no longer to save the world. The goal is to love the world and the humans and non-humans in it, and to care for them as best we can while we can. Each of us will express that love and care in different ways. Some ways will be practical, some spiritual. Some ways will be political, some entirely earthly and homebound. Some ways will be very local, and some will be wider in scope. Our actions can affirm the value of human and non-human life, ease suffering, and foster supportive community instead of cruelty. This shift from the goal of saving the world is hard mental work because it requires letting go of the stories of modernity that are embedded in us, those of us raised in industrial consumer society anyway. More on that in the next chapter. Giving up on saving the world is also hard emotional work. Coming to terms with the immense losses it implies is heartbreaking. Further, it is hard on the ego. Do I have to let go of so much? Can I really only do so little? The industrial consumer ego has been vastly overinflated. As they decide how to live honorably and well with the reality of loss, people are discovering new priorities and new values. I'll say it again. As they decide how to live honorably and well with the reality of loss, people are discovering new priorities and new values. Better understanding our limits means that the loss of a job, a personal project, an organization, a home, a beloved landscape, a human right or freedom, or a community may be part of the process of collapse. As hard as it is to live through, it is not a personal failure or a sign of incompetence. Knowing that any of us can experience such a loss we can commit to supporting each other through hard times. And we can learn to live as if earth matters, with humility and gratitude, as if we are one small part of a wondrous planetary metabolism, our earth home. Perspective. It's really that bad, and I am not alone. Kat has been the coordinator of the Deep Adaptation Forum, she hosts and participates is in as many gatherings in the forum as she's able. She also runs a nonprofit ecological consultancy and makes a home with her family on an acre in the north of Scotland. She is sometimes found in her new garden, scheming, digging, chasing chickens, or weeping. She is often found in one of the forum's many Zoom meetings, holding space for people facing our predicament. 
These are her words about discovering others who thought like her about the state of the world. Quote, Sustainability, the climate crisis, the ecological challenges of biodiversity loss and extinctions, that's been my career. Because of the circles I move in, Jem Bendel's paper, Deep Adaptation, came to my attention within just a few weeks of it being published in August of 2018. I was in the car park at my office, about to start my drive home. An email came in with Jem's article. I clicked on it. I thought, I'll just have a quick scan and see if it's really something I want to read. And then I'll put the music on and I'll make my 90-minute journey home. And I'll have dinner with my husband and everything will be lovely and I can forget all the troubles of the day. I opened the article to start scanning it, and I was still in the car, parked, three hours later. And then I sat still for a long time. I just thought, someone said it out loud. Finally, someone, a voice from within the system, has written it down and said it out loud. I was overwhelmed. I wrote to Jem on that day. I sent an email saying, quote, I can't believe what you've done. It's paradigm shifting for me. Congratulations on having the courage to put yourself out there to actually write all this stuff down and say it in public, unquote. Because these aren't things that you're allowed to talk about within the sustainability sector, it was unacceptable. You know, quiet, hushed conversations in the back of a conference room, questioning or challenging some assumption that had been made uh, was the closest thing you could, get, you could get. For my entire career, I've held the knowledge that the system was probably going to collapse within my lifetime. I'd held that on my own. Me thinking, maybe I'm mad. What do I know? I'm just a scientist. I'm not a global expert on anything. So there was always that second guessing of the self. But you feel it. Sensitive people, we may not even be able to articulate it or describe it. But there's a sense of the dis-ease in your system as you observe the world around you. It can be in really simple situations. There's a dis-ease in you. This is not right. This is not right. Jem's paper was saying, damn straight it's not right. Here's a really good illustration of all the ways that it's not right and where they're going. So when I discovered that the Deep Adaptation Forum was being convened, I joined. Within a day or two, I had an email welcoming me to the community and asking me, would I be prepared to volunteer? And, there are here, and here are some of the gaps that we're looking to fill. So I agreed to volunteer. I felt like I had found my tribe. I was 49 years old, and suddenly it was okay to talk about things that I had held in my body since I was 13 years old. Not only did I now have a vocabulary, but I also had a community of people with whom I could share this knowledge. It was joyful, and it was hideous. It was joyful because of the ability to make those connections, because of that sense of not being alone. And it was hideous because although I'd carried that knowledge in my system throughout all my life, I hadn't really accepted it, because I hadn't heard it from anyone else. No one ever spoke about that dis-ease. No one ever spoke about the observations about how the world was unraveling. So it was a mixed blessing to find the deep adaptation community. There was this relief, ah, it's a bunch of people who feel the way I do. And then there was the, fuck, there's a bunch of people that feel the way I do. This is fucking real. The grieving process, particularly in the first year, was at times debilitating. I remember being in the car and seeing something and thinking, for how many years will I observe this? The poignant, beautiful moment. This poignant, beautiful moment and having to pull over at the side of the road and weep, racking sobs of grief over what is being lost. The comfort, camaraderie, fellowship, and belonging have strengthened in the last three years that I've been a part of the community, and the grieving has never eased. Now I grieve more, deeper, and for more things. I have found my participation in the Deep Adaptation Forum to be strengthening. It's enhanced and built my capacity for being with what's broken and messy and untidy. My capacity to be with grief has grown sufficiently so that it's now never overwhelming. And it's inspired me to do things with my community for resilience as well. A healthy form of avoidance. Do you feel obligated to attend to all the tragedies of the world? You are not, truly. 
nor are you required to be up on predictions of future catastrophes. Know how much exposure to suffering that is not your own is too much for you to process. Then do not subject yourself to that much. Thanks to the internet, negative news is relentless. It's easy to fill our eyes and ears with stories we don't need to know. We are not meant to hold the disasters and outrages of the whole world in our tribal-sized minds. Notice which news sources and types of articles are informing you of something new versus articulates versus articles that are redundant or mostly gossip. Consider limiting disturbing news and social media posts to a small portion of your day, or even of your week, so that you have time to live, love, and create. Occasionally, I run into people who are sure that humans will be extinct in five to ten years. They've usually been listening to Guy McPherson and his colleagues. Things are bad and getting worse, true. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, underestimates the severity of our predicament every time. True. Yet we do not know enough to predict a schedule for our various collapses. While our minds crave certainty and our predicament offers little, creating false certainty is not helpful in my opinion. Therefore, I typically avoid Guy McPherson and his near-term human extinction. Our Earth system is very complex and defies accurate predictions. Each of us faces personal extinction of at our death. We always have. Loss of a way of life. A life, or even many lives, is far from the extinction of the human species. Let's live, grow, create, and love in the face of uncertainty. Another author, Michael Dowd, also finds it helpful to accept the possibility of worst-case scenarios. Yet he does not spend his time making predictions. Instead, he ponders ways to make sense of collapse, ways to cope, and ways to be of service. He writes, speaks, curates, and records the work of others as the, at the website postdoom.com. Audio narrator, Michael Dowd speaking. On the Postdoom website, there's three main pages. The first is conversations. I've had about 90 post-doom conversations with literally some of the top people in the world who get the big picture, including the scary stuff, the scariest, who've done the hard work and then come to a place of inspired local action. So that's the conversation page. Then there's also the connect page, which is about forums and discussions and places and some of the most pastoral videos that I have, the most short and emotionally supportive. And then the resources page, which is just chock full of audios, video, text, uh, documentaries, uh, podcasts, you name it. So you could spend a lot of time there. So I encourage you to check those out at postdoom.com. And finally, I've, I've got a different take than Terry the Page does on Guy McPherson. I've done two videos, one called Doubt on McPherson, uh, which was quite popular and a lot of comments, like 600 comments, and then also... Hopium Dealers Hall of Fame, with a nod to Guy McPherson. Perspective. Getting real. Karen Perry stewards the Chickenfoot Ranch in Northern California with her partner Jordan, and expects the worst. She wrote the following guide for responding to our predicament. She calls it GRACE, G-R-A-C slash E, getting real about collapse slash extinction. She writes, The civilizational way of living has never been sustainable. The 10,000-year experiment of living differently, separate from the rest of the community of life, has always risen and then fallen. Global industrial civilization is collapsing, just as every civilizational model before this one has done. This time, however, the harnessing of fossil fuel energy has made our species homo colossus, giants, with the ability to destroy the natural systems required for our survival. The result is, in addition to societal collapse, the biosphere we depend on for life is also collapsing. This is, this is a predicament, not a problem, thus requiring wise responses, not false solutions. And then she has uh, ten things listed here. One, before the truth will set you free, it will likely make you angry. Don't shoot the messenger. Two, let go or be dragged. Get through the grief and know that freedom and benefits exist in acceptance. Three, grab a buddy who won't pull you down. It's harder to get real alone 
Expect other crabs in the pot to constantly let yank on you. Resist the urge to pull others down if you slip back into denial. 4. Abandon hopium. Hope and false solutions are placeholders for inaction. Both are harmful responses to our predicament and can foster even more denialism. 5. We all would benefit from becoming much more comfortable with death and dying. 6. Nature is primary, period. No more humans first. Making amends to the rest of the community of life while attempting to clean up the mess needs to be a daily way of life. Every day is Earth Day. 7. There needs to be an urgent conversation about setting the younger generation free and what that can look like. Continuing to pass along the dominant culture's denialism is super abusive. 8. If the response feels predictable and familiar, it's not the right response. Our species is really being challenged to elevate. It's not about becoming more clever. Predicaments do not have solutions. We need radical responses equal to this radical situation. Logic says if it's a cancerous growth, and growth is the issue, the first response is to stop growth. 9. Apply grace. Getting real about collapse extinction. This list. Apply this to daily living and let it guide all your decision-making. If you have privilege left in the game, what will you use it for? And 10. Bottom line. We have to get comfortable talking about it. Continuing to bury our heads in the sand is not the path to enlightenment. People say, quote, Well, if this is happening, then there's nothing we can do about it, so why think about it? It's just too depressing. Unquote. I would say in response, see numbers 6, nature's primary, and 7, setting the younger generation free. Audio narrator's note, Michael Dowd speaking. I have several conversations with Jordan Perry and Karen Perry uh, that are featured near the top of the postdoom.com website. They're some of my closest colleagues and friends in this movement. Don't do this alone. A quote from Wendell Berry. I believe that the community, in the fullest sense, a place and all its creatures, is the smallest unit of health, and that to speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. Find your people. Find the people who will support you through the hard times and through the changes you want to make to face the hard times. And recognize that you are a small part of a vast, interconnected earth home that is sustaining you. You will hear this call to human and non-human community many times in this book because it is so essential. Industrial consumer society relies on the illusion of separation, the belief that people are independent of the human and non-human systems that sustain us through long and often exploitative supply chains. We in the U.S. have made independence a virtue, and no wonder, in a society where most of our interactions are transactional, buying and selling, owning and paying debts, and competition for status and stuff, rather than respectful and reciprocal relationships. We have paid a dear price, a, culture epi a cultural epidemic of loneliness and the loss of many of the skills and strategies of our ancestors that allowed them to live and work together for the common good. To face the storm that so many ignore, we need people who understand us, Few people can sustain a new identity and values in the midst of the old unless they spend time with people who support those new values and that new identity. They need not be our blood family, neighbors, or closest friends. Who supports you in being you? Who can you talk to about how you might want to live, about what matters, and how you want to show up in these times? Who is already living these values that you want to live? Respectful relationships with non-human entities have been devalued, suppressed, or forgotten by industrialization, colonialism, and extractive capitalism for generations. I'll say that again. Respectful relationships with non-human entities have been devalued, suppressed, or forgotten by industrialization, colonization, or colonism, and extractive capitalism for generations. That forgetting has allowed industrial consumer society to ravage the planet. 
The barriers to recovering these essential relationships are formidable. Modernity does not even allow language for the interconnection of the human and the non-human. Attending to relationships with a non-human or more-than-human world with respect and wisdom is new to me. That attention can look many different ways, but it is a key practice for affirming that we all rely on our earth home for belonging and sustenance. For the past two years, I have been talking with people around the globe who are experiencing and exploring ways of living outside or in the cracks of industrial consumer society. The first gift of these online friends was to support me in grieving our losses, even as I supported them, and to plot ways together to live and love in the face of loss. This book is possible only because of my friends in the Deep Adaptation Forum. These friends have changed me in other ways. Some of them refused to fly. I had been in the middle of the pack with my mostly well-off friends. They profess concern about carbon emissions, but fly for business or pleasure every chance they get. Now I think long and hard before flying. Modern life makes it easier technologically to create groups of like-minded people supporting each other, and it leaves us without the relational skills to sustain those groups. Cultivating and maintaining relationships requires time, skill, and commitment. Industrial consumer society has convinced us that time is for producing and consuming, not for building relationships. Still, finding your people is necessary to begin to live outside the values of industrial consumer society. We will return again and again to this challenge of community and solidarity in the eye of the storm. Many Voices Living in Two Worlds Once we know about unfolding collapses, we can't unknow them, and we probably can't force others to know them. Facing the denial in our culture, we will have to figure out how to live in two worlds. If you're struggling with this, you're in good company. Someone asked on the Deep Adaptation private Facebook page, How do you psychologically manage doing business as usual, driving in your gas-burning car to your capitalism-serving job, for example, and being collapse-aware, wanting to or trying to live as if Earth mattered? People from around the globe answered. Here are some of their responses. I don't know. I just have frequent breakdowns. I call it living in the twilight zone. I find it difficult every day. This conundrum has plagued me for years. My head tells me, oh shit, we need to do something. And my actions seem to say, another day, another dollar. It causes me to feel self-loathing at sometimes. It is surreal. It is a surreal feeling, to say the least. Here's how some people navigate the cognitive dissonance of living in two worlds. Four bullet points. One, it's called compartmentalization. I know it, the reality of collapse, is there all the time, but I need to distract myself from it in order to live life. It's hard. For me, it's distinguishing my work from my side hustle. My side hustle is the business as usual that I need to do to stay alive. My work is to heal my inner realm, to transform my trauma, leading me to find my life purpose. Managing small steps I tackle on my own that contribute gives me more gives me some calm. I live in southwest Florida. <laughs> Need I say more? The only thing I can control is my reaction to anything. And the last bullet point, take some action. Even a very small action will make you feel more positive. Even just having a plan to take action is a start. People offered particular actions that help them in living in two worlds. And here are five bullet points. First one, I wish I could stop participating, but then I don't know how I would support my family. It's not like we can be hunter-gatherers anymore when every acre of land is owned by somebody now. So I'm trying to build an eco-friendly business and helping to start a community garden. Next bullet point, sending emails to politicians, to companies, showing up for every town meeting that I possibly can, showing up to every political meeting I can, organizing. Next bullet point. I work in solar, so even though I know collapse is coming, I know that my work helps buy us time as a planet. It helps people save money and gets better prepared and get better prepared for emergencies. Next bullet. I walk most places. It certainly limited my reach. I look at it as a psychological adaptation to collapse. 
I feel like a good example of living differently, my version of in this world, but not of it. And then somebody else said, I do hospice volunteer work. Some people have chosen to quit their jobs or live very simply in response to the tension of living in two worlds. Two responses. I quit that stupid job in 2020 and got a permanent work-from-home job. It's still 40 hours a week, which is unhealthy, but at least I don't waste any time commuting. I have more time to try to grow food and do other household stuff that keeps our consumption to a minimum. And the second response? For me, it was important to stop. I didn't have dependents, so I could handle financial and housing vulnerability. I closed my company, didn't sell it as that would have meant its ecological impact continued. I moved into a low-impact tiny house, swapping a little labor each week for use of the land. I used my time growing vegetables and offering support and, and information to others on how to navigate these times, how to need less money, and adaptation. Living in two worlds, we face deep loss, both ongoing and anticipated, and a whole culture surrounding us that refuses to acknowledge that loss. That is why grief work is a necessary part of being the eye of the storm. We need this work. Grief is addressed later in the book. Strangely, the loss that may most disorient people is a loss of meaning. Cultural stories that once defined and guided us no longer ring true. So part of being the eye of the storm is discovering different stories that are not part of the systems of denial and destruction, but instead are life-giving in this time. Stories that affirm meaning and identity despite great loss. The next two chapters are about stories, the stories that are killing us, and some stories that invite us to live differently. Summary and Reflection Eight bullet points. One, in 2018 I came to a gut-level realization of our unfolding predicament. That realization came with awareness and an awareness that saving the world as we know it does not seem possible. Two, in groups I have hosted, participants express relief that they don't have to pretend that we can save the world as we know it. Together we are finding meaningful ways to live and love in the face of great loss. Three, Kat knew from adolescence that business as usual was not sustainable. She remembers the power of discovering that she was not alone in her thinking. She now has a community to support her in this heartbreaking reality. Four, we don't know enough to make accurate predictions about timelines for the losses I'm calling collapse. And uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as it is, living with uncertainty is better than making dire predictions that send people digging their own graves. 5. Karen Perry's Guide to Grace, G-R-A-C-E, Getting Real About Collapse Extinction, in 10 steps, is practical and wise. There's much good work to be done. 7. Strong community, human and non-human, is essential to meet the unfolding storms. Fear is contagious, calm is contagious, and courage is contagious. 7. Find the people who will support you in, through the hard times and through the changes that you want to make. And 8. Living in two worlds, that of business as usual and that of collapse awareness, is not easy. People are using various strategies to cope and to live differently. And audio narrator's note, there's several things on the Postum website that are related to the difference between collapse awareness and collapse acceptance. You can find more at the Connect page on the Postum website.